What's your hot take as an email marketer? Uh, A-B testing is overrated, specifically, <laughs> on, specifically on campaigns. In my opinion, this is my hot take. I think the people that blame iOS 15 as the only thing is just lazy because they're, they just have not thought outside of the box of paid ads. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Building Blocks podcast. Today, I'm joined by Jacob Sappington, who is currently the partner at Homestead Email and SMS. Welcome to the show, Jacob. Hey, Jason. Thanks for having me on. I actually met Jacob two and a half years ago on Twitter. Um, how, how did you, like, how did we meet? Yeah, so um, we had a, a mutual connection. Um, uh, at the time, another, you know, a partner at Wong House, uh, Adrian, was was helping you run the ship there. And um, at the time, um, I had reached out to him. I said, hey, um, I, I signed up for your emails. I think there's some opportunity here within your account. Let me let me give you a free audit and see what we can uncover in there. And so um, give you a free audit. Uh, and you guys were actually my my first client um, freelancing. <laughs> so, uh, you know, deeply appreciative for the opportunity that you gave me and, um, you know, glad, you know, really happy to see the work that I was able to put in place there, you know, leading strategy for you. And then uh, to see, uh, you know, the growth that, that Doe has seen, um, you know, prior to me coming on and then, you know, just all the new product rollouts you guys have had, the, the product um, development, um, just, you know, the, uh, um, what's what I'm looking for here? Uh, you guys really press the needle on, um, you know, cutting edge marketing. Like the, a recent email that you guys sent out was the, PD, you know, in the email, there's an Easter egg on these products, find these ones and uh, you, you know, you'll get a discount on this product. So, um, so yeah, so we, we got introduced. I, I helped you guys out with your email for a little bit and then you guys have, you know, taken it a, a level up from there since and it's been really cool to see. Yeah, I didn't know that we were your first client until like much later. Like you came in swinging with an audit and you literally came in and made such a huge change to our retention channel that made me believe in retention channel. Cause I was, I was an influencer marketing guy. That was my background. And I was, you know, I dabble in paid ads. Retention has never been a thing that I was proud of. Um, and I think you set the bar. We're still trying to reach that bar you set, by the way. Uh, there, there's a period of time when, I think email accounted for 38% of our revenue. You, you, you yeah. know, like the first couple months, we're, we're yeah. like, that was the bar. Whenever I interviewed new agencies, I said, this is what we did. <laughs> so, so like, we got to look at that. And I, I don't think anyone has ever gone back to that yet. You can also argue we have done a lot more net new acquisitions, but yep. I, I'm always like, look at what Jacob Sappington did. <laughs> yep. Yep. Well, hey, I'm, I'm glad I was able to set that bar for you. And I think that, uh, um, you know, as, as I was preparing for this, you know, short call here, I was, I was thinking like, you know, uh, 38%, 40%, you know, whatever it is, like that's not attainable without a good product. And, you know, the work that you guys have done on social and product development, um, it makes it a lot easier. So, um, yeah, we, I, I put in some, some things in place that, you know, obviously helped your channel out, but ultimately, you know, um, tactics alone don't win an email. Really on that same topic, I, I want to hear your thoughts on like your take on retention because there's this whole discussion online. It's like paid marketing is not really what defines your brand. It's not what scales, right? That That's what they say about paid marketing. But really what helps retention marketing, you mentioned products, you mentioned brand. Like what is that thing that is outside of your control as a retention marketer that brand needs to be aware of to really help you become more successful? Yeah, as, as I mentioned it, like it really comes back to product. Like um, obviously paid ads work to, to get people familiar with product. Um, I think like retention channels, like they're really this opportunity for you to like speak with your customer, remind them that you, that you exist, show off new products. But at the end of the day, um, the most important thing is, um, you know, product like ads, you know, uh, emails, SMS, like these are all just touch points. You know, it's kind of that, you know, that classical, um, attribution, issue of, you know, radio, billboard, um, social media, like what really drove that sale. And at the end of the day, like these are all just touch points and, you know, we're trying to smartly layer in these touch points. Um, just again, just remind people why you exist, how you solve their problems, um, why they need your product and, and without a good product that just doesn't happen. So, um, so yeah, really, really dives into the product. Absolutely. 
Uh, I heard through a little birdie recently. You guys had a big viral moment on Reddit. Wanted to ask you a little bit more about that. Um, and, and from my understanding, it wasn't like a revenue driving campaign you guys did. Yeah. Um, tell me more about that. Yeah, uh, it actually just happened uh, yesterday. Um, I, I was filling out, you know, preparing for this call, and that was something that I thought was really cool. Was um, I, I think that you know the own channel is just an opportunity for you to like build these relationships, you know, talk to your customers. And we we had a client who um, uh, sells sells product to a very popular um, Netflix TV show uh, for Bridgerton, and um, it, they got leaked on Reddit as you know they have these fabric swatches for free. Um, mm-hmm. and so they ended up getting 1200 orders placed, um, overnight, uh, for free fabric swatches. And one person tried to place an order for 200,000 swatches. Holy um, crap. yeah. And so we, we checked the numbers and we saw that, uh, that out of that, it was 1200 orders. We had about 400 people who were consented, uh, who had signed up for our emails. Um, so we took that segment, we wrote a quick little plain text email, like just poking fun at it, like, Hey, glad you found us. Um, no, you're not getting all those swatches. Like who is the maniac that thought they were going to get 200,000 swatches? Like what were you even going to do with them? And then like we positioned like, Hey, if you actually want to try our gloves, we'll, we'll send you this. And we gave them 10% off. Um, as of last night, when I checked that again, I hadn't driven any revenue, but I think like having that thought, thought process to like communicating with your customers, even if they're not your ideal customers in that situation, I think that's the thought, the thought process more, means more than the revenue itself. It was a small audience of people, who didn't care about us, frankly. Um, so it didn't surprise me that the revenue hasn't came from it. But um, again, I'm more proud of the thought process that went behind it. Oftentimes, these things come up much, much later. You, you're definitely more memorable um, because oftentimes customers don't get an immediate communication back on something that they just did on your site, except for the usual win back or like abandoned card checkout. So when they saw this opportunity and they did something and they felt like they got caught, that's memorable. Yeah. They're like, oh shit, this brand is watching out. They're they're looking out for for us. What else could they be doing? You know, if they're paying attention to this, what else could they be paying attention to? And, and in my head, like, even though that's not a revenue generating campaign, that's still something that keeps you top of mind. And honestly, I, I, at the core of advertising, and just continuously putting your brand on top of people's mind, and you keep doing that until the end. <laughs> that's really it. And honestly, there's a small chance that our campaign could be screenshotted by one of those um, 400 people that we sent it to and they could post it on Twitter, Instagram, and it, and it could go viral. And then that in itself could bring in tens of thousands of dollars. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a, it's a shot in the dark. It's kind of a lottery ticket, but again, the, the process to talk to your customers like that's really what matters. Absolutely. And that's what I loved about working with you is that we, back when we were working together, we, we did a lot of out of the box email marketing campaign like you remember when we sent that blank template we sent a blank template just to see what it would do and tons of people were like hey did you mean to do this it's like uh no we didn't we didn't mean to do this but yeah i remember that there's a lot of fun things that i do and and again i always look back to every single person i work with now it's it's always a reference you're like that kid that graduated and the teacher just couldn't stop talking about (laughs) like you have like a picture hung on a wall like there's a bar that you set and there's also like the fun shit that you did and like you know me we worked together for over a year i i love doing unconventional stuff because for me selfishly it's really fun um I, i hate doing boring ads um but for you to be a marketer that is also willing to do these things, you kind of have to be a little silly um, and, and willing to try these things solo. And agency just wouldn't do that for us, like traditional agencies. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's tough. But yeah, those uh, uh, oddball moments or like, you know, off the cuff ideas are always, you know, probably the most fun to execute. It, it did. It's probably going to do next to no revenue, but it's right. you know, definitely going to be one of my favorites from this past month. I, I would say like, I think these things add on it and multiply the intensity of success from future campaigns because people remember you more. They're like, oh yeah, they make me laugh last time. You yep. know, yep. maybe I'll open this time. Yep. And I think the client is appreciative. Um, just like the speed that it took to implement it, that we were, you know, he, he, he was, he came to us and didn't say, Hey, I have this idea. He came to us and said, Hey, I'm going to be late getting those revisions back to you. We had, this 1200 orders come in, we're having to go through and cancel all the fraudulent ones. And so just bear with me. I'm like, Hey, this is a, this is a, a moment right here. Let's, let's do something with this. You're actually that person that taught me to poke fun at our misfortunes. Um, you know, when we ran out of products, 
we sent an email saying, hey, guys, we, we effed up. Uh, and like really acknowledging it, like being public and, and saying that and being transparent, like you're the person that really made me do that more. And we do that now, um, you know, when we run out of stock or when we oversold or um, if there's a product defect, like just poking fun at it and being transparent. And we were kind of early doing that because now brands do that. But we were early doing it because we realized that being transparent is really the key to standing out in the world of all the brands who have this wall of communication. We're only going to text you in very formal type of language. And like we we will sprinkle some pictures here and there. And then you told me, like, you know, what? send them an email like how you would send an email to your friends. We did a lot of plain text emails. You you yeah. shifted my my thoughts on plain text email. And, I, and I'm very, very grateful for that. Yeah. Awesome. I'm glad I could do that. <laughs> I wanted to touch a little bit more on retention marketing, but not on specific strategies, but more so on your thought process in how this industry has changed recently, but also like the general public perceptions, because for most people, retention isn't something that they learn in school. They kind of jump into it because of someone like you on their team, but eventually they found the need for it. So what, what would you say is like a common misconception that people had when they first get into retention marketing? Um, for me personally, I was like, I'm just going to set up 23 different flows and then let it fly. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah. and, and that's, that's the one that we see a lot is like, people are like, um, we need more flows. We need more flows. We need more flows. And, um, yeah, I, I think that there's something to be said about like respecting the inbox, like not being in the inbox, in the inbox every single day, um, communicating, like, you know, just like, you know, talking to your customers, like we've already said, you know, like, talking to them, like they're real people. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's the big one is that people think that more flows fixes everything, that more emails fixes everything. I um, mean, it's, it's a pretty bad trap to get into. Like we, we talk to people who are sending an email every single day for 30 days. And, um, you know, maybe that works. You know, you've already removed everyone who's going to unsubscribe at that point. Um, you're, you know, you have a, a small list of... Um, core people who will really purchase whatever you have, but that list isn't that, that audience that will purchase everything you put out isn't getting bigger because an email every single day is just too much. And so, yeah, the, the big thing that we see is just people thinking that more and more email is the um, end all be all when you just can't do that. If you want long-term success anyways, it'll, yeah. it'll, it'll certainly work in the short term. You'll see increased revenue and then eventually you'll see, you know, just the health of your list degrade. So it's a big one. Got it. You, you obviously see a lot of accounts. Um, you've seen accounts that post every single day. And you see accounts that are a lot more intentional, less volume, but very, very high quality emails. Do you see that the emails with high volume, like once a day, they eventually exhaust their list and, and it tapers off. But like during the times that they do it, they obviously squeeze a lot of money, but then eventually just dries out. Is that what you're seeing or something else? Yeah, yeah. So that's, definitely part of it is like you're you're dwindling that list like people continue to unsubscribe and at, at a certain point you actually run out of people who are willing to unsubscribe at some point you've reached an audience of people who are comfortable having probably like you probably thirty thousand emails in their inbox um just chilling and um you know at that point people see you in their inbox but it doesn't mean anything to them like it doesn't elicit an emotional response to like oh i need to get to this because they know that it's going to be in their inbox again tomorrow um, so we, we, we do see that those lists eventually perform worse and worse. And the downside to that is that the long-term ramifications is that you're hurting your overall deliverability. So you're shrinking that audience that cares about what you say. And then eventually the domain providers are going to say, Hey, we see that, um, G Gmail says, Hey, we see that your people that you're saying to don't open and click your email. You're probably spam. You're, you're, uh, you're just not going to be prioritizing the inbox. And so it's, it's like I said, it's a really easy short term trap to fall into because you think more revenue, but that's just not holding the long term viewpoint. And it's also difficult because it's kind of based on theory. Like, you can, like I can sit here and say that this is going to happen. But if you sit here and say, well, my unsubscribe rate isn't going up whenever I increase sins, then I then my audience is fine when it's uh, you're really relying on one KPI to um, decide your whole entire strategy. Absolutely. I. I do want to ask you some stuff that would just spice things up. Let's do hot takes. Hot takes. All right, let's do it. What's your hot take as an email marketer? Uh, A-B testing is overrated, specifically, <laughs> on, specifically on campaigns. Um, I, I think whenever you A-B test campaigns, you're introducing another variable into the equation. 
um, unless you have a massive list, like if you have, you know, 200, 300,000 higher, you know, multiple hundreds of thousands, if not more, um, then you're introducing time as a variable um, that you can't equate for in open rates. The other thing is, is that although Clavio now gives us the option to segment out engagers based off of um, Apple privacy protection being true, they can still get onto your list in other ways, such as, you know, through our engage segments, they can get on there by being active on site, being or clicking an email, placing an order. And so they could have fulfilled those engagement metrics, um, but we're still going to have uh, higher open rates. Um, and so if I sent a campaign to two groups, you know, AB a- test it, um, it might just be random distribution luck that group A has 20% more Apple mail privacy protection users in it. And so, um, yeah, so my, my hot take is that A-B testing subject lines is probably not worth your time. On flows, you can probably get away with it because it's a more, um, it's a more intent-based audience. So we can, we can make decisions on opens and clicks there. But for campaigns, you just add in another variable to it and you can't control that distribution of users. Absolutely. On the same topic of the hot take, obviously your team retention and you have... You, you work in an agency that does paid as well. Um, is there like a constant battle of I am better than you or is this, let's just work together mutually and I think we can grow together. Yeah, so I, I consider own channels like dependent channels. So they are um, without paid ads, without organic SEO, you know, whatever it is, like my flows aren't gonna run um, because, you know. There's no people. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and that channel, that those campaigns that I'm sending to previously acquired customers were acquired using, were required to using paid. Um, when we look at campaign or when we look at like account um, health, like we want to see a really healthy mix of campaigns and flow revenue. So like in a perfect world, it's 15% campaigns, 15% flows. What that tells me is that we are able to convert um, people coming to the site like new with the flows and we're able to convert um, previous purchasers with campaigns. So yeah, we, it's a, it's a, you know, we work together um, in tandem and uh, yeah, without, with, without us, their ads aren't as effective and without um, them, we don't have our list. So we got to work together. I love to hear it. Um, there, there's sometimes just marketers that just think you're not going to live without me. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I, I just think that's such a bad way to think about it. Like diversifying your channel is so important when, when this whole Alice 15 thing happened or even 14.5, everyone starts blaming each other. Yeah. And it, I, in my opinion, this is my hot take. I think the people that blame Alice 15 as the only thing is just lazy um, because they they just have not thought outside of the box of paid ads. There's so many things that they could do um, way outside of the Facebook ads manager that they haven't explored. And so when that thing went down, their entire ship sunk. Well, yeah, because you just never thought it, it will happen to you. You thought you're spending so much money, you have so much data and that you will be bulletproof and then you're not. <laughs> you know, when the dust settle, yeah. it really shows. Yeah, and we're, we, we're in an industry that moves really quickly. And so if you don't make adjustments to 14.5 to 15 to whatever the next privacy protection thing that Apple puts out, like you will get left behind. And unfortunately, that's why we're seeing a lot of businesses struggle is just because they haven't been able to um, to adjust in a, in a correct manner, I guess. Yeah. Uh, off the topic of email now, I want to talk to you a little bit more about being a partner. You recently got, um, I'm going to say promote, you, you joined as a partner at right. Homestead. And before that, you were um, you were doing retention at... Com- com- 4 by right? 400 4, 4, 4, 4 by 400 Sorry, I always yeah. get those two mixed up because they're like neighbors. <laughs> and then yeah. yeah. friends. Um, so sorry about that. And then before that, you were working with me, or or maybe you have something in between, right? Or uh, so I, I was doing freelance, and then um, worked at four by four hundred full time, and then now partner at Homestead. Yeah. And I and it's obviously a great progression that I'm seeing. Like that, that's what I think is an ideal progression for a really talented marketer. What what's been the biggest difference you're seeing from role to role in terms of your mindset, like how you approach work now as a partner versus just, you know, working for someone else. And also like the biggest difference you're seeing in your personal growth. Yeah. Um, I'll address that first one or that last one first, like biggest thing that I've seen in personal growth is just like helping lead a team. Like, you know, um, in the past, like I was the person that came to my boss and 
you know, frustrated because, you know, X, Y, Z went wrong. And, and now I'm that person or one of those people that, um, that someone comes to, uh, with concerns and, and, you know, whenever workload gets heavy, like, you know, how can we shift priorities around here? And so I, I would say that it's really helped me to, uh, to help lead better. Um, I think the other part of your question was what's the difference. Um, I, I guess the, the biggest difference going from like, uh, employee to then like partner is has been I'm, I'm still involved in part of the account day to day at homestead um but again the biggest part has been being involved in the sales process you know being a, a team lead for um for our employees uh helping them navigate through fires and everything but um yeah here, here in the future i, I think there's going to be even more leadership opportunities as, as we grow as a company and i uh, really excited for that and i love that you are able to have that perspective as you know, someone in their position who's now reporting to you, you're like, yeah, I, I get that your workload is heavy. I understand because I was literally in your shoes two and a half years ago. Yeah. Um, and, and I think empathy through that experience is so important as a leader. There's so many bad managers. Can account for how many bad ones there are. Um, and, and I think the fact that you've been through it makes you a better leader, in my opinion. And hopefully that is, you know, may, maybe I'll quit some of your direct reports on that. But um no, it, it's definitely a, a whole different game because when you work on someone's account as an employee, there's obviously incentives, which is keeping a job and, and doing whatever and, and, and putting out the fires of the day. And then once you move into a partner level or an ownership level, it's like you have to start building fireproof walls instead of just putting out fires. And then you got to do the two things at once. Yep, <laughs> and yep. then you got to figure out how to get more firemen to help out and, and do those two things. And it, it does get chaotic sometimes, but I, I know you're, you've are you been always uh, capable of managing workload. Uh, I think that's one thing that I've always respected about you. I feel like I just did like an episode just to praise you. But no, truly, I, I always tell people, this is what we've done in the past, and I want us to get back to those days. Um, and I actually tell them to like reference your tweets, like read your stuff. And so I just want to say like from a previous, like a former coworker, that that's the impact that you've made at our company. And I don't think I've ever said, said that to you. Yeah, I appreciate that. Sounds like I need to start tweeting some more too. So you guys have more content to go off. Take of. it back up. Come on. Our, our entire company depends on you now. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jacob, awesome. I am so happy to actually reconnect with you. I, I know we've all been so busy and it's hard to talk because you live in, in the middle of a cornfield. Uh, I do. I do. <laughs> that was that was the joke of the entire time that we were working together. You're in Illinois. Yep. Yep. And his internet was always so spotty <laughs> during calls. Like we would just freeze and we would just make fun of him saying, oh man, the cornfield Wi-Fi is not working anymore. Yep. We, we recently got an upgrade here at the office that I rent to 300 megabytes per second. So I'm so proud um, of you. Yes, we're getting there. Big, big growth in all, in all aspects, huge. I guess. Huge. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Where can we find you? Where can we find Homestead? Yeah, um, you can find me on Twitter at Jay Sappington. And then Homestead at um, the URL is homesteadstudio.co. Um, and we, we do growth, we do retention. Um, we can, you know, some clients choose us for, for both growth and retention. And then they, they can also kind of uh, pick their services that they want. So um, we have a pretty, pretty wide array of, of clients, you know, as, as niche down as, you know, really fancy gloves that are like truly one of a kind you know, all the way to, you know, more generic stuff like supplements. So we, we have a pretty wide array of clients and definitely a, uh, um, a benefit, you know, just seeing how, how we think through objections of trying to sell um, $200 gloves versus, you know, $30 supplements. So, so yeah, we're, we're available for growth and retention. Love that. Well, thank you, Jacob. We'll see you soon. All right. Thanks, Jason. Good to talk again. You just heard an episode of the Building Blocks podcast. If you like what you heard, subscribe below to keep hearing conversations that I have with brilliant marketers, founders, and innovators on how they built their best ideas. Now, if you want to learn how you can turn your best ideas and build something massive out of it, visit my website, bbclass.co, or follow my Twitter at agro.